you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If you're into Twitter, you can monitor our tweets at EE Journal TFM. And don't forget, if you would like to follow my personal Twitter account, check out Amelia D1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, sure, I dig it. You can follow me or us on LinkedIn as well. And we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash EE Journal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by me. And you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. Also, by clicking the links below the player on this week's Fish Frying page, you can subscribe to this here podcast through Spotify, Podbean, or Apple Podcasts. And remember, if you'd like to further support this podcast, please leave me a review on Apple Podcasts. It really does help. Also, if you'd like any further information about the stories covered in today's show, just head on over to EE Journal. Hi, Igor. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, thank you very much for having me. Thank you. So we're talking about a recent breakthrough in nanocrystal technology led by your team at University Chicago that could lead to new electronic devices in the future. So, Igor, before we dig into the details, can you give us a nanocrystal refresher and what kind of challenges you were looking to solve here? Sure, I'm glad to do so. So nanocrystals, in very simple terms, are just very small chunks of what is normally bulk matter. To give you a sense of the length scale, if a typical bacterium is on the order of one to four microns or a millionth of a meter. In the case of the nanocrystals that we work with, these are on the order of maybe about five nanometers. So about a thousand times smaller than that. Now, in terms of composition, these can be metals, they can be semiconductors. In the case of semiconductors, we usually refer to these materials as quantum dots. And they are especially useful because they have the ability to absorb and emit light, which makes them useful for a variety of applications, ranging from solar cells to television displays, for example. In fact, I'm willing to bet that almost all of your listeners probably would have seen quantum dots in a HEV set, whether they know it or not. These have become rather ubiquitous over the past few years. If you see any display from Samsung or uh, other companies that says something like QLED or QD on them, it's a certain bet that they have quantum dots in them. So these are a very mature material class. In terms of the specific challenge that we were trying to get at with this particular study is to try and go beyond just having the nanocrystals themselves. As a community, we have gotten quite good at making the nanocrystals with very high monodispersity. This means that all of the particles have roughly the same size. We can easily control the size, even the shape and the composition of the nanocrystals. But now we would like to go further. We would like to use the nanocrystals as building blocks in order to build new artificial solids. We call these supercrystals because they are essentially crystals made up of smaller crystals. So imagine that you have a powerful microscope, you would look at one of our super crystals and you see an orderly array of components, but then you crank up the magnification and you see that the components themselves are crystalline. So that's the meaning of this word, super crystal. Now, ideally, in order to have super crystals that have interesting properties, we would like to have two key elements, strong coupling between the nanocrystals. In simpler terms, we want them to be able to talk to each other, but that means that we need to bring them very close together. And the other property was to maintain long range order in the system. And unfortunately in the past, it has proven quite challenging to have both of these components at the same time. And that was the challenge that our current work was trying to address. 
So your new study has found a way to make nanocrystals function together electronically. So tell me more about this. And this involves shaving hairs from these nanocrystals, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. So in the past, the community has been extremely successful at making very beautiful ordered structures out of nanocrystals. But the nanocrystals that people generally work with have these hairs on them. The more technical term is ligands. The reason we include these ligands is that they allow the nanoparticles to be dispersed in various types of liquids that makes it much easier to work with them. For example, you can cast films out of them, you can make solids out of them. It greatly reduces the processing uh, challenges of working with such materials. However, the problem is that these hairs get in the way of nanocrystals talking to each other. When nanoparticles go from solution into a solid, the distance that they can approach each other is limited by the length of these hairs or ligands. We're not talking about huge distances in most cases. For typical organic molecules that we use, it's maybe one, two, or three nanometers. But it turns out that even this relatively small distance is huge as far as electrons are concerned. It's very difficult for neighboring nanoparticles to talk to each other or, for example, transfer either electrons from one to another or any kind of energy when there is this insulating barrier separating them. However, the hairs are actually useful in terms of creating ordered assemblies. The reason for that is as nanoparticles get very close to each other, there are very strong intermolecular forces that can. You can think of this as a Velcro of sorts. Imagine you have two pieces of Velcro and you move them close to each other. In the beginning, you can easily slide them past each other as long as they're not touching. But at a given point, as the fibers of the Velcro start touching each other, the two pieces will snap in place and you will no longer be able to easily slide it up and down. In some sense, the whatever configuration you have is locked in and that configuration may not be ideal. As a result, when people try to assemble nanocrystals without these sorts of hair, they found that the particles snapped into place like Velcro in very open, disordered configurations, which is not ideal. So the tricky part here would be to shave off the hairs in order to allow the nanoparticles to get very close to each other, but at the same time, do this in a way that still allows you to form well-ordered crystals. And the trick we found is that if we control the process through which we take the nanoparticles from a well-dispersed solution and slowly destabilize that solution by throwing in a salt, we could take advantage of some rather exotic new physics in order to ensure that the nanoparticles did not behave like Velcro, but could easily attach and disattach as the solution was destabilized, allowing us to grow very beautiful crystals out of a variety of materials. And the new crystals that we have, the separation between them went down from just a couple of nanometers to something on the order of half a nanometer. Now, this may not sound like a huge change, but in terms of electronic properties, it's a game changer. And the reason for that is the probability for an electron to jump from one nanoparticle to another depends exponentially on the surface to surface separation between them. So just changing the separation by a little bit over a nanometer produces a change of more than a million in terms of the rate of electron transfer between the particles. So Igor, what kind of applications or areas do you see this kind of technology being a good fit for? I would say that we have just barely begun to scratch the surface in terms of where this combination of long range order and strong coupling can be useful for. 
We can certainly think of more modest progress. So, for example, if we think of typical devices such as photo detectors or light emitting devices, in general, introducing a degree of order is useful for a variety of properties. For example, the way these devices function, let's take light emitting devices made out of quantum dots. You need electrons to be able to move through this array of quantum dots, and then the quantum dots will take the electrons, the energy um, in them, and turn it into light. That is basically how these devices operate. But ideally, for such devices to work efficiently, you want to minimize the degree of disorder in the system. Whether you're talking about electrons moving through an array of quantum dots or other forms of energy, disorder is usually your enemy. For example, take a typical roadway. If the road is smooth and straight, then you can put your car in cruise control and go quite fast. In fact, you can go to Germany, you can go on an Autobahn, and you can go up to hundreds of kilometers per hour if you're brave enough. But now imagine that you introduce all sorts of meandering roads or various speed bumps along the way. Needless to say, the speed at which you can drive will go down drastically. This analogy works surprisingly well as far as electrons moving through these nanocrystal solids goes. If you have variations in the surface-to-surface -surface separation between nanocrystals, if you have various discontinuities in the films, that will certainly slow down the rate at which you can move the electrons from place A to place B along the path that you want them to travel across. And this will reduce the efficiency of the devices. It can reduce the total brightness you can get out of them. It can introduce various pathways for the devices to break down. In other words, disorder is something we want to reduce across the board as a way of improving device performance. So this is a relatively straightforward way in which improving device performance simply by going from strongly coupled but disordered solids and now working with supercrystalline solids. There are challenges along the way in terms of creating the films themselves, but that is the general roadmap for how we can think of improving these devices. But what I think is especially challenging and exciting is the fact that this combination of strong coupling and long range order in these nanocrystal assemblies is completely unprecedented, which means that we are just barely beginning to scratch the surface in terms of trying to figure out where such materials can really shine. So, of course, we are happy that we are able to report these materials, but now we are working with a variety of collaborators to try and understand their fundamental properties and essentially see which applications they may be best suited for. But at this point, we are at a very preliminary stage in terms of screening the materials and seeing what they may be good for, which is quite exciting. Absolutely. Now, this is a breakthrough, not only in technological innovation, but also a step forward in new material research as well, right? Mm-hmm. We would certainly like to think so. I mean, think of traditional conventional solids. You can think of a variety of ways in which you can create more complicated structures. But at the end of the day, you are limited by the periodic table in terms of the kinds of atoms you can build these crystals out of. On the other hand, when we are thinking of this new class of strongly coupled artificial solids, the equivalent periodic table is all the nanocrystals that we can make. And over the past few decades, there has been an explosion in the variety of nanocrystals that can be made with high quality out of a wide variety of materials. As a result, now we have a vast library of nanocrystals of different sizes, different shapes, different compositions, we can even have more complicated onion-like structures where the composition varies. In other words, 
the palette of materials that we are working with is incredibly vast. And that means that the total number of combinations we can think of creating using this periodic table of nanocrystals is truly without limit. As a result, I think it's quite exciting to think of the possibilities that can be explored using this platform as a kind of sandbox to see how can we use the existing library of nanocrystals that we already know how to make and to now combine them into these new artificial solids where we can control both the nature of the building blocks and their arrangement in these highly ordered supercrystals. Fantastic. All right. It is time for your off the cuff question. Are you ready? I am ready. Okay. So a lot of us can't have our favorite foods these days because of lack of travel or the restaurant has been closed. So if you could have one meal right now, it doesn't matter if it's on the other side of your state, the other side of the country or the world, what would you have? Well, I'm a sucker for fresh seafood. So if I could pick one meal, it would be just a a plate of grilled calamari, octopus, ideally with a nice glass of wine. And if I could be picky about it, somewhere overlooking the Mediterranean would be great. I love that. That sounds absolutely amazing. Okay, Igor, I think that's all I have time for. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If you're into Twitter, you can monitor our tweets at EE Journal TFM. And don't forget, if you would like to follow my personal Twitter account, check out Amelia D 1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, sure, I dig it. You can follow me or us on LinkedIn as well. And we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash eejournal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by me. And you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. Also, by clicking the links below the player on this week's Fish Frying page, you can subscribe to this here podcast through Spotify, Podbean, or Apple Podcasts. And remember, if you'd like to further support this podcast, please leave me a review on Apple Podcasts. It really does help. Also, if you'd like any further information about the stories covered in today's show, just head on over to eejournal.com and look for this week's Fish Frying page. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or heck you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com, or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of May 15th, 2022, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried. <laughs>